Hey guys, and welcome back to another Unfiltered Gamer board game review. Today's game up on the tabletop is Epic Seven Arise, the board game. This is the board game based on the popular mobile game Epic Seven, which I have been playing for years. This is made by Farside, Smilegate, Japanime Games, and Super Creative, brought to you here by Japanime Games. It's a one to four player tactical game with a turn-based RPG system, where you're moving from tile to tile, defeating monsters, completing objectives, completing side objectives and side stories, and defeating bosses. You're going to be playing as either one or two characters, choosing between up to nine of the different choices, and each of them are going to have their own unique skill sets and passive abilities, health and defense and speed, and you're going to be going up against monsters that pop up on this monster board over here. Every round, you're going to be able to complete, hopefully, some type of objective, moving on to another board here. And once you've completed the whole layout, this whole setting, uh, you're going to be going on to the next chapter. When you do that, you'll actually get to go to a shop, buy items, equip your character with some unique artifacts as well, and utilize a stronger skill deck that gives you skill points that you can utilize for your specific types of uh, character abilities. Can you complete the objectives and score more points than your opponents in this course? cooperative and semi-cooperative game because at the end of the game, after you finish the full chapter, you'll see who has the most soul stones and how many of the different types they have. And that player, provided they have the most points, is the winner. All right, I'll tell you how to set the game up, how to play, and of course, my review. So while Epic Seven Arise is not a super complex game to learn, there is a fairly complex setup because you're going to be looking at the rule book and you're going to be looking at the boxes. There's a wide variety of boxes in the game, they're going to be called like a side story or chapter one, chapter two, chapter three, and each of the boxes are going to have their own unique cards and tiles, etc. etc. We're taking a look at the first chapter for setup. When you begin setup in a just in a general way, here's how it works each player is going to get one character when you're playing a four player game. If you're playing anything less than four players, either one person will get two characters or two players will get two characters, depending on if it's a two or a three player game. All right now I've got a two player game set up, so I have two characters for one player and two for another. When you're playing a two player game, each of these characters are going to get all of the same things except for their skill deck. Give each character uh, two of their meeples. You choose what color meeple you want. It could be blue, purple, yellow, or green, and set them on their character board, along with any bonuses that character might have, like Bologna has a die. Each character is also going to get soul stones. They're going to get two of them, and they're going to be chosen randomly, and there are three types of soul stones. It doesn't matter which two they get, as long as they get two. And then give each character health tokens. Each character will get health tokens based on the upper left hand corner of their card based on the number. In most cases it will be either four, five, or six. And then if you're playing a four player game uh, or you only have one character, you'll be getting ten skill cards from the skill deck. If you have two characters, meaning you're controlling two characters, you will share one skill deck of ten cards with both of your characters. And here's how this works. There are three types of skill cards, and it's not super explained in the rule book, but how it works is the main skill cards are separate from the um, action skill cards. These skill cards are going to have numbers, so they're going to be one through six, and you're going to shuffle all of them up and put them on the skill point card space on the market. And then you're going to deal out ten cards to each of the players, and then each player is going to draw five cards from their shuffled decks and utilize them uh, on the round when they take their turn. And the rest will go on this area here. Then you're going to take the artifact cards. They're just regular artifact cards. They're this is the action cards. They're not the equipments. You'll shuffle all those up. They're going to have art on them. And you're going to place them on the artifact card space. Don't forget to also check your deck for equipment cards. If they say the word equipment, there's I believe about 15 of them, you'll shuffle them up and you'll set them aside. They're only going to be used in certain games and only for the campaign mode. The next thing you're going to want to do is set up the monster board on this side over here. I'll move this so you guys can see it a little better. The monster board is going to have enemy attack cards on the far left hand side. You'll shuffle that deck up and you'll place two of them in the upper left hand corner of the large rectangle. And that should be 
all you need as far as the uh, base setup of the game goes. Now, wh what the heck is going on with the map and all the characters and whatnot? Well, you will choose a character for each of the characters you've picked, the little miniature, and you will select the base that represents the specific, um, the specific tokens for the character. So for instance, if I have Raz here and he's got the green meeple, I'll have a green base with Raz. So you've got your characters now. So now you're gonna select your chapter. Your chapter is going to be found in a box here, and this box will have all the cards that you need in order to play it. So I'm going to choose chapter one. You're going to take the story cards and you're going to put them face up with uh, the story side facing up on the story card space in the market. And you'll have chapter uh, one, and then it'll go story one, story 2A, story 2B, story 3A, 3B, etc., etc. Place them in order and set them face up right here. And then you're going to go ahead and check the back of your story card. You'll read that and you'll continue if it tells you to continue up into the point where you get to a starting card. A starting card is going to allow you to start building your story up. So what you'll do is you will follow along with exactly the piece of paper says, or in this case here, it's going to be the card here, and put the exact tiles down in order. Now there's a chunk of tiles here, which hopefully you can see, but there's a large stack of tiles, and it'll tell you on here what tiles to utilize, and the effects, and any tokens you might utilize, and whatever comes inside the box is typically going to go with this. And then you can go ahead and leave it right here. Now as far as the meeples go, what you will do is uh, based on the amount of soul stones is where this friendship track is going to be. And I think it's all going to start out in whatever position you want. However, for speed purposes, you're going to have each of the characters based on their speed place their meeple on the speed track on the monster board here. So Bologna has a speed of 6, so you'll place this character here on 6. And then Luna has a speed of 4, placing this on 4. Uh, then you're going to have Kroz. Kroz has got a speed of 6. And finally, you're going to have Roz. And then Roz is going to have a speed of 5. So this is where you place all your characters' speed down. Uh, you've built your board now based on the story. And you have placed down your uh, chapter side objectives. Uh, they're going to go in the middle here, and they're going to be random. There's quite a few of them. And any other special objectives in the game, like these little tokens uh, here. You'll be placing them down onto the game board. Um, and then you'll have each character be selected from uh, friendship mode order <laughs> in these little squares. Each of these uh, tiles here are going to have uh, circles that are going to have numbers represented on them. Place each of your little characters in these spaces based on this order. Yellow good to choose first, then green, then purple, and then blue, uh, but it could be different based on how you set the game up. So, after you have your speed set up, your friendship set up, your main attack board slash monster board set up, and of course your, your shop area with all your different tokens, uh, and your characters are pretty much good to go. Don't forget, however, to make sure that you include all the different tokens in the game, as well as potions that will go just below the shop board that you guys can pick up along the way of the game. And after that, you're pretty much ready to begin the game. Make sure everybody has five cards for each character, or if you're playing with two characters, just draw five cards for the more sooner speed character in the line. And yeah, let's talk about how to play the game now. In Epic Seven Arise, there is four main portions of gameplay. This is gonna take over a round. And basically how it works is the first portion of gameplay is going to be the reveal or story card phase. Then it's gonna be followed up by the exploration phase, moving your characters from one area to another if possible. Uh, there's going to be a combat phase, which you're going to be flipping over monsters to fight. And then finally, you're going to go to the movement phase. In the first phase of the game, what's going to happen is you're going to reveal a story card and implement whatever the story card tells you to do, whether it be putting maps down and putting tokens on those maps and side stories and where your characters are going to go and any other benefits that the story might provide to you. After you've done everything that the story asks you to do, you will check to see the mission. And in this case here, I've shortened the mission just so that you can see the monster board. So normally there's four tiles, but in this case there's just going to be three so that you can see um, these tokens here as well as this board here, which is rather important in gameplay. And because the game is so big, I wanted to reduce it just down to a little bit. After you have set everything up and you've learned the specific objective, and in this case here it is to find Arky. Arky is like a little mascot in the game. It's basically Roz's like a familiar type creature where you're searching the plains to find him after being asleep for many, many years. There's a large, intricate story, which if you want to learn more, learn more, there is actually a mobile game, like I said, that you can watch and play the story. And the game's actually very, very, very good. I really enjoy it. So 
What you do during the story mode phase is not only flip over a story card and set everything up, but also there's a buying phase. You're going to be looking at this merchant board and there are three things you can buy. Potions, which generally will cost you one soul stone. Skill point cards, which will cost you one soul stone. And then artifact cards, which will cost you two. If you're playing a two player game though, each of these are going to be doubled in price. Meaning that a skill point card would cost you two and an artifact card would cost you four. Skill point cards go into your deck, they're what you utilize to cast your skills, and artifact cards are one-time use benefits that are either going to allow you to have a multiple use number at the very top of their card, or at the bottom is some type of ability that you can utilize for your character. And potions are basically full health potions. You can simply utilize that, they're given to only your character specifically, and you can heal yourself or another character with these potions. After you're done with going ahead and purchasing any items, you'll move on to the exploration phase, which means you're going to select a map tile to move to. If it is a new map tile that you wish to move to, you're going to first check to see what monsters spawn there, and you're going to draw a chapter card from the chapter deck here. And you're going to flip over cards, or a card. The card can either be a boss, or it can be monsters. And typically speaking, it's going to actually be monsters. A monster card is actually going to be placed right on top of the deck, and the reason for that is that the monster card actually has speed of all the monsters on the card. And it might say that, like, for instance, a wyvern has got a speed of 4, whereas maybe little mouse soldiers have a speed of 8. The higher speed you have, the last you're going to be going in turn order. Along with, of course, the speed represented by your characters on the speed board down below. Monsters above, characters below, ties go to players, monsters are going to go next unless there are bosses then bosses will take precedent over monsters and after you've gone ahead and set up the order you're going to then check to see what monsters you put on the next little game board here and in this case like i said we've got two little mice and we've got a wyvern but you're not just going to place these guys on the game board you also need to go ahead and pull out the tokens representing the monsters and you'll place them anywhere on this board it doesn't actually have to be in the little circle areas that's only where your characters go um, but you will need these little square bases because this will represent the different monsters and their health totals, which can be different based on the story you're playing. Higher story, likely to have more life for the monsters. Place your little character, which has a little notch, um, on the health bar and place it on the health spot that it's supposed to go on. The soldiers, these little guys here, are actually going to have 4 HP, and the wyvern in this case will have 3, but that can change based on uh, how far you are into the game. Make sure the notch touches the actual HP of the monster. Now you've got your monsters on your bases with their HP and your characters, and you're ready to move to combat. Combat in the game is fairly simple. What you're going to do is you're going to be attempting to move into this area, but you have to defeat the monsters in order to get to that area. When you go to that specific location to battle, you're going to actually trigger any side effects or side objectives that might be there. For instance, now you have to defeat all enemies in three rounds during this battle in order to successfully gain the rewards of this, otherwise you'll suffer the, de the, the negatives or the, the, the not-so-great effects of this. And this is going to be a reminder for you as you go throughout the uh, battle. Uh, battle is pretty simple as well. You will go and you will check the speed of your monsters, uh, your players, and the monsters. And in order, you will be doing turns. Um, so, for instance, I've got this purple character here, which is going to happen to be Luna, and she has the highest speed at 4, followed up by the wyvern with 4, so she's going to go first. And because I'm sharing characters with two players, she's going to draw five cards from the total deck that represents both Bologna and Luna. You've got your five cards in hand. Well, now what do you do? Well, each of the skill point cards are going to be represented by numbers, whether it be one, two, three, four, five, or six. There are three abilities on your character card. The first ability requires you to play a pair in order to utilize it. The second requires you to play three in a row. One, two, three, two, three, four, three, four, five, etc., etc. And the final one is three of a kind. So I've got a 3, 4, 3, 4, and a 5. So I can go ahead and play a 3, I can then play a 4, and I can play a 5. That's a straight, I can use Dragon Knight's Will. That's going to let me uh, uh, add an extra damage for all the attacks I make this turn. So I can go ahead and do that. Whenever I play a blue card, 
I get to draw a card for playing a card, and I get to draw a card for playing a blue card based on the symbol on the bottom left hand side. So I'll basically be drawing basically my entire deck of cards. Now remember, you're limited to what you have in your deck, so once you've utilized it, that's basically it. But now I've got a ton of cards that I can play. So I'm going to look through my hand, and I'm going to select to play triples. Three, three, and three. Can't draw any more cards, I have no more cards to draw, but I can do Ragnar Spear which is going to do two damage as a magical effect. And because I did Dragon Knight's Will, I'm going to do three damage. And I can choose which character I want to damage. I want to damage, specifically, this Wyvern. He's got a lot of defense, and usually speaking, defense will block, block basic attacks. But because my attack is magic, it's simply going to be removed from the game, because it'll take three damage magic-wise, no armor involved, and will die. I'll check to see what I get, what benefit, which is usually Soul Stones. I'll draw that specific Soul Stone and give it to Luna. And then I'm going to be ending my turn if I cannot do anything else. But turns out I can. I can play two more fives. I can do an Infinity Slash. I can do a one damage plus Dragon Knight's Will for two damage on one of these little, little uh, mighty soldiers, bringing it from four health to two health. Now I'm done. I can't do anything else. I'm out of cards that I can utilize. I've got a two and a four. So every red card that I played is going to give me a soul, um, one of these souls here. So I'll take two of them because I played two, three red cards. Boop, boop. And then all of my cards will go back into my deck and I will shuffle. And then we'll check the next person in turn, or turn order. Now I defeated the Wyvern, so the Wyvern is gone. So I will move on to green. And I would do green, which green is going to be uh, Raz here. He would draw his five cards, perform his abilities, rinse and repeat up until the monsters. And I'm gonna explain how monsters work because I think you get how characters work. It's pairs, three of a kind, and three in a row. And it's, it's so it's technically it's pairs, three in a row, and then three of a kind based on the three abilities. It's not explained on the character sheet, but it is explained in the rules, although I wish it was explained here. Um, then, so we'll go ahead and show you how monsters work. Now, at the beginning of the game, you're gonna go ahead and discard two enemy attack cards, which means that these are not gonna be represented in the game. And you're gonna draw an attack card for the enemy that's attacking next. And we'll go to this mice is, mouse is attacking, and it's attacking three. Well, you'll check the circle that your character is on, and you will see that Krau is actually on three. So Krau is going to take an attack, deal three damage, and silence that target. Wow, that's pretty powerful. So three damage minus my armor. I have one armor, so I'll take two. I'll lose two HP, and he's now silenced. I'll take a silence token, and I can no longer do soul burn abilities for a round, and pass. The next monster will attack, revealing a new enemy card. It's a one. I'll check to see one. <laughs> one happens to be Raz. Raz will take, once again, uh, two damage, or three damage, but I have one armor, two armor, so I'll actually only take one damage, and will be silenced and you'll rinse and repeat. You'll just keep going until one thing happens or the other. Either A, everybody gets knocked down, or B, all the monsters are removed. And in most cases, the monsters are going to be removed. When the monsters are removed, all your characters are going to move into their new positions based on their friendship order. This little track here just represents whoever has the most power at the end of the round is going to be placed in the farther back, or as the player with the least amount of power or victory points based on these little soul stones here is going to be in the front. And you're going to be able to choose things like when to move or what happens in a tie. That's mainly what this area is for, where speed is for combat and who starts off first. Remember, there are certain spaces on the game boards that have either one or two numbers. Two numbers means you're more likely to be hit, whereas one number means you're more likely to not be hit. So choose accordingly based on what you are or how much you want to mess with your opponents. And you're once again going to run rinse and repeat. You're going to check to see if your story card has been completed. If not, you're going to ignore the whole story card portion. You'll move on to the exploration phase by once again discarding the monster, flipping over a new chapter, fighting new monsters in the next area, and so on and so forth. In this case, searching for Arky. Whenever you go to a specific location, you'll also check to see on the bottom of the token if Arky is there. And if he's not, you're going to actually keep going. And you keep going from there. Don't forget to also check your little side stories too, see if you completed them. Oh, we defeated them all in one round. That means we beat, we beat them before three. So we'll get this benefit of gaining one soul or one, one potion for each character. These are all like group effects. It's either everybody or nobody, unless characters are dead. And yeah, that's how the game works. You'll eventually come across Arky. You will then be able to go on to the next story card based on what happened, um, either going to 2A or 2B, whether Arky was there or not. And flipping over new monsters, new areas and locations, new effects can happen, and new characters can come into play. You might visit and see some other characters that you might not have seen uh, represented on the miniatures in the game. And whenever you flip these cards over, meaning you finish this, this area here, 
that's when you're gonna go back to the merchant board as well. Whenever you do your storyboard, that's when you're going to be doing your buying skill point cards, buying artifact cards, and buying potions, and et cetera, et cetera. That's basically how you play the game. There's some really cool, unique mechanics to the game I'm gonna be talking about in the review, such as soul burning and dual attacking and all that kind of stuff. But as far as a basic understanding overview, I think that's pretty good. Epic Seven Arise can be played in either the story mode slash campaign mode, where you go from the entire story to the next chapter chapter, etc, etc, keeping certain cards and certain items along the way, or you can play them as one shots. You can pull one out and just simply go through it and see if you guys can complete it or not. This is a competitive game on one end where you're trying to gather as many of these soul stones as possible, which are also considered currency, uh, and whoever has the most at the end will win, uh, but you're also needing to succeed together as a group. If you do not succeed, you cannot win, and if you do not have the most of all the resources, you can't win as well. So you have to, in certain circumstances, give some uh, uh, in, in certain circumstances, you have to take some or maybe give some negatives to your opponents. And so along the way, you're basically making hard choices. The game is going to be featured around two different systems, the friendship system here and, of course, the uh, speed system here. Speed is all about attacking and friendship is all about coordination and ties and all that kind of stuff. And then each of the characters represent different characters from the mobile game. Everything in here is based on the art from the mobile game, the different locations in the mobile game, as far as the different stories and adventures you've gone through, and the different characters with their, all their special abilities. And each character feels very, very different as far as what they do. They have health, which if they get knocked out, they're done, unless they can come back or if everybody's wiped out, that's it. They have armor, which works just like most games. You do three damage and something has two armor, you're doing one damage to the actual character, and speed. Speed is decided on how fast you go on your turn. Each character has three abilities. These three abilities will do something based on whether you're playing a, playing a pair or three in a row or three of a kind, but they also have a cool thing, which I didn't talk about, is soul burning. As you play red cards, you will gain these little souls here. Uh, these souls are going to allow you to sacrifice them when playing cards to use your abilities in order to do a bonus ability. Like, for instance, that Dragon uh, Knight's Will, which gives all my abilities one extra damage. It also says get two plus two damage tokens or two plus two defense tokens, max of two of each type, for two souls. And so you can spend these guys here to gain bonuses when soul burning for specific abilities. They all function differently. Some do more attacks, some make attacks magical damage. Uh, some of them are going to give you certain types of tokens, whether it be extra damage or extra defense or being able to silence or mess with your enemies in certain ways. And there's also dual attacks. So on your little um, uh, on your little friendship board here, you're going to see little soul icons on the bottom of the little areas, one, two, three, and four. On the one, it'll cost you two souls, and then two is three souls, and it just goes up from there. And how dual attack works is pretty simple. With your attack, you can choose to do a dual attack. You can spend the proper souls, take a card, uh, one of these little skill point cards from your opponent's hand, and play it on their side of the field, as well as one of yours and utilize one of their abilities. So you can actually swing your sword and at the same time you can choose to have your opponent come over and swing their sword as well. It counts as your attack. So you can do com c c c combo attacks in the game. Um, Combat is rather simple. Yeah, you're just going through the motions, drawing your cards, playing your cards. There's a lot of card drawing happening in the game. Um, that's my one neat thing about this game is, is the rules in this game are not specifically well written. I would have actually paid to have somebody like my wife uh, fix the rules up because you can tell this game has been translated. So certain things don't make super sense. Like it's hard, I've only played two or three, three chapters, three chapters of the game, um, but when you play any card in the game that says you can draw a card. And then when you play a blue card, you can draw an extra card. When you only have 10 cards in your deck, all you really need to do is play two cards to basically draw your entire deck. Um, it might be actually that whenever you play a blue card, you draw, and whenever you play a red card, you don't draw, but that's not what the rules said. So I specifically went with how the rules specified the game, which made it quite easy for the first couple rounds. And in fact, even at the end, it still wasn't super difficult. Um, so this game might be more about trying to score the most points than worried about your team kind of getting KO'd, which is still a possibility, maybe when fighting bosses, because those are the most powerful, but throughout the, the monsters, you're just kind of whacking them and it's not really a huge deal. 
Uh, speaking of the monsters and whatnot, we have the story. It's interesting. There's a little story arc that goes through for each of the chapters, and then they're kind of like from one section to the other, adding new little intricacies, and I won't explain too much of it, but you're going to be visiting different locations. There are a ton of tiles in the game. There's quite a lot of monster miniatures in the game as well. And there's a lot of chapter cards, which will involve different types of monsters. The monsters get subtly more dangerous as we go along. And yeah, all these tiles here are represented in the game. And each of these are represented by, actually, uh, the, the mobile game. You'll play these actual tiles. Kind of wish that they did double-sided, but one side will say palace, and that's kind of nice as well. So you can kind of just find the woods when you're doing a woods map. You don't have to super, like, dig through all these tiles. So on one end, I do like that. I love how the boards are notched, so you can start adding things like secondary objectives to them. I like the little baby objectives that you're going through each of the times that you're trying to, like, move through these maps, and you'll have choices. Eventually, as you progress the story, you're going to have separate areas you can choose to move through, whether it be left or right or forward. You can go through a portal and there's there's all these things that can start happening. The game gets much more complex as you progress and a little bit more challenging as well. Character models are beautiful, wonderful. These look like the characters that I play with. Bologna is one of my favorites in the game and she's represented the game wonderfully. It's a really cool character and she's very powerful. And I love that. All the characters have their own unique functions and abilities and it just feels good to play with the characters. I'm gonna be loving to paint these models. If, if nothing else, if I never play this game again, which I will be, I wanna play through the entire thing at least once. But even if I didn't, I would go through painting these guys meticulously because they did an excellent job with the miniatures and the monsters. And there's quite a lot of monsters. You're going to have the monsters, which are represented in three different forms. The really big bases, the small bases, the medium base monsters. There's a whole chunk of them I could, like, I guess, pull them all over. I'll show you some B-roll. And then you actually have the boss monsters. The boss monsters are represented in red, and they're going to represent different, like, boss monsters and boss characters that will exist, including the formidable Vildred, which is also one of my favorite characters in the game. But that's just because he's he's broken, and he's, he's, he's amazing. So, yeah, there's a ton of these miniatures in the game, and they're all really high quality. They're, like, soft plastic, so you don't have to worry about them actually busting on you, which is nice. Um... And yeah, the game's pretty straightforward. That's what you're trying to do. You're trying to gather these soul stones and get the most at the end of the story arc. And if you can do so, you win, which I like. I like how there's not a huge amount of rules in the game, but certain things definitely do need clarity. It, it's like there's like three or four things specifically that are hard to understand, like, um, like how many bosses actually go in this deck? Can you actually fight three bosses in a row? Is that just a thing that can happen if you're unlucky? Because in the video game, you know, you start with small monsters, you move on to a little bit stronger ones, and then there's a boss. In this case, it could be that you just fight a bunch of bosses all in a row, um, which I guess would be fine if that's how they're going about it. Uh, understanding, to the, um, uh, the abilities and how they work, like, this says I do a damage, and then if I use a soul burn, I do two damage. Does that mean I do three damage altogether, which means that I can get through two armor? Or does that mean if I there's a monster with two armor, I do zero and zero? It doesn't really explain that. And there's, there's just like certain little translation things in this game that really annoy me. But otherwise, overall, the game plays well. It's easy to understand. The characters, the art, everything is really, really cool. The storyline works. This feels like the mobile game. And it's set to where you can play in basically between two and four players. I don't think this is one player. Even if it is, I wouldn't play it because there's just too much to keep track of. But this would be definitely, in my opinion, best at four players. And it's really well done. There's a ton of expansion content, which there is attached to this as well. I've got all the different extra expansion characters. And if you're interested in picking up the game, there's a link down below. For me, this is a solid pickup, but I'd like to see some translations online to make sure an FAQ somewhere so that I can get a better understanding of the game. And I also like a reference card so that I can go through the steps so that I don't have to go back into the rulebook and look, at least for my first couple playthroughs. But overall, anyway, I love the mobile game and this is a lot of fun and it feels like the mobile game. They do a very good job. Thank you guys for watching another Unfiltered Gamer board game review for the game, Epic Seven Arise, the board game by lots of companies. If you'd like to say, there's a link down below in the description where you can go ahead and check out the game for yourself. And if you're interested, you can check out our live streams every Wednesday and every Sunday. Wednesdays are whatnot, Sundays are Twitch, Facebook, and YouTube, where you can watch us play games just like this one here. All right, guys, that's pretty much all I got for you this time. And as always, I look forward to venturing out with you with your party versus mine in Epic 7 next time.